The film opens with a scene set in a swimming pool, before taking the audience back in time to the early days of the 1989 Romanian Revolution. As the military, police, and secret police attempt to quell the protests, the situation spirals out of control, leading to a state of chaos where anyone could potentially be branded a terrorist. The narrative then shifts to a domestic setting. Officer Stanis is preparing to leave his home. His wife assists him with his coat and reminds him to stay safe. Outside, civilians are actively protesting against the officer officers, soldiers, and policemen. At the office, efforts are being made by the officers to curb the violence, with everyone engrossed in their respective roles. In the conference room, the senior most officer becomes frustrated following a phone call instructing them not to use any weapons, despite the imminent danger they face. This is particularly concerning, as they had been warned on the 17th of a potential civil war. The team is left scrambling to devise a strategy to manage the situation. Meanwhile, a security officer in the office complies with an order to permit some civilian activists to enter and verify the absence of any prisoners in an attempt to pacify them. He dispatches a comrade to carry out this task. The escalating number of people in the conference room heightens their anxiety about the impending crisis and threats to their lives. Some suggest the need for additional police and security personnel for their protection. Outside, an officer attempts to reassure the protesters that they are free to express their dissent peacefully. He assures them of the Army's support, the absence of any prisoners in the military building, and that no shots have been fired by the army. However, the crowd remains agitated, continuing to protest loudly, with some entering the building to verify the officers' claims. Back at the office, the officers are watching the news when suddenly gunshots ring out. They quickly learn that civilians have breached the armory, leading to a continuation of the violence. One of the officers calls his friend to update him on the situation, assuring him of his safety and asking him to comfort his wife. The situation escalates when the officer witnesses his friend, Officer Niku, being shot, realizing that they are under fire from both the army and the protesters, they attempt to assist those who have been shot and are still alive, seeking refuge in a corner of the room. In a desperate bid to blend in with the civilians, they hastily discard their uniforms and weapons. They attempt to call for emergency assistance, but to no avail. They also discover that the president has fled via helicopter. The gunfire intensifies, making escape from the building a perilous endeavor. Many are shot in the ensuing chaos. The officer tries to aid his friend voice, but finds him already dead. He is then apprehended and assaulted by the protesters. Meanwhile, a man named Leahu and a woman make their way to his car parked behind the building. They are approached by a random officer who inquires about their destination. Upon learning that they are heading to the party headquarters, he requests to accompany them. Subsequently, two more women join them, and they set off together. Observing a woman bleeding, he advises her to seek medical attention at a hospital. He also questions another woman about why she is out with her daughter, learning that she is searching for her husband who is among the revolutionaries. He he suggests that it would be safer for her and her daughter to wait for him at home. Back at the headquarters, some civilians attempt to burn a picture of the president and demand an officer to surrender. Some are filming the scene and looting valuable items they find. Meanwhile, first aid is being administered to the injured. The people's defiance is also evident in the media. The civilian leader here requests their troops to stand down, but other officers forcefully restrain him. A high-ranking officer in the police and secret service office calls for backup, but receives no promising response to say safely evacuate the building. The activists then plan to visit the tourism office to obtain a comprehensive city map. Leahu takes on the responsibility of transporting the former officer due to his access to a car. They escort him out amidst insults. Suddenly, gunshots ring out on their way to the car and Leahu provides cover for the other civilians. The police and army are now securing the area, rescuing survivors and maintaining peace. However, an individual who fails to comply with a weapons check is killed. Other traffic police officers plead for their lives. Lives. News circulates via television that the water supply has been poisoned. An officer receives permission to defend himself, provided he doesn't harm civilians. That night, he and a doctor discuss their belief that this could signal the end of communism, leaving him feeling desperate. Surviving officers are rounded up by the army, forced to relinquish their possessions, and herded into a hallway. A deceased officer's body is displayed as a scare tactic. When the detained officers ask for water, they are mocked by the army, who tell them the water is poisoned and undrinkable. Later that night, some of the detainees had their clothes returned and received medical assistance. However, a sudden gunfire attack forced the security forces to hastily evacuate the building. Due to a shortage of space for the prisoners, they were moved to an empty indoor swimming pool the following day. The army leader arrived and assured them that he was prepared to do whatever was necessary and that the army was on the side of the people. They were given water, bread, and a few blankets once they confessed. Officer Stanis was the first to drink the water after confirming it wasn't poisoned. Over time, 
time, more detainees were added. Staniz was later allowed to see a doctor due to his severe injuries and illness. An ambulance was called, but he was hesitant to drink tap water. The lights suddenly went out. In the ambulance, he met his wife who asked if he had shot any army men as rumored. He denied the allegations, insisting he hadn't harmed anyone. Upon reaching the hospital, his wife introduced him to a nurse who would help him recover and plan an escape. For now, he was given a bed and began receiving treatment. That night, all the patients in the recovery room were restrained, a measure ordered by the comrades to prevent escape attempts. The following morning, an army officer stormed into their room, demanding to know who had flashed a light through the windows the previous night. The doctor intervened, reminding him that hospital norms prohibit violence. The army officer left reluctantly, warning them to free up beds for his people instead of the so-called terrorists. Outside the hospital, a crowd had gathered, waiting to visit their hospitalized family members and identify their deceased relatives. Among them was the woman Liahu had given a ride to, who was searching for her husband. A cameraman was filming the dead bodies. Later, Leahu and others on the street celebrated their newfound freedom, chanting, Free Romania, and waving flags. A boy asked Leahu to teach him how to shoot, a request to which he agreed. They went to the forest for the shooting lesson, and then headed to the boy's home. However, they were ambushed by army forces and brutally beaten, despite their attempts to convince them that they were on the army's side. Upon inspecting a car, a map detailing the city's military routine was discovered, raising suspicions. At the police headquarters, a crowd gathered seeking information about their relatives. A woman, an internal affairs employee, showed her ID and was allowed entry with her daughter. When questioned about a tunnel leading from the headquarters to the Conti Hotel, she denied any knowledge and was arrested. Another woman, previously seen on television, was also arrested along with other women in the hallway. Inside, a prisoner tried to console a lonely girl. Meanwhile, a food line for the men turned chaotic, requiring soldier intervention. The women rebelled against security over restroom access. Officer Staniz, who was exploring escape routes, was caught by soldiers under the pretense of looking for a restroom, and their conversation was interrupted by a nurse. After their departure, a police officer pleaded for help to escape, asserting his innocence and dedication to his country. After much persuasion, she agreed to inform his wife of his safety. The following morning, as Romania celebrated its freedom, they were apprehended by army soldiers, tied to a car roof, and taken to prison. Inside, Leahu, a boy, and another man were arrested. The boy, refusing to eat, was comforted by Leahu but protested his innocence, expressing his desire to return home while being mistreated by the officers. The officers convened to plan their escape, debating whether to confess their actions and clarify their mission. Leahu, however, distanced himself from their actions. With Officer Stanis's assistance, they found an opportune moment to escape amidst gunshots. Soldiers brought in a boy suspected of poisoning the water tank, causing the prisoners to turn on each other. Officer M then drew a map, asking the prisoners about their initial locations and movements. After much investigation, they learned of Russian spies who spoke Romanian fluently, shifting their suspicions. A man then arrived, proclaiming his innocence and accusing the others of murder. It was revealed that he was the father of the deceased boy. Later, Leahu approached Officer Staniz, revealing that he had witnessed a shooting. He proposed a deal. If Staniz helped the boy with him, Leahu would keep his secret. Otherwise, he threatened to expose Stanisi to everyone. With a warning, Leahu left. That night, gunfire erupted at the women's prison, prompting everyone to take cover. The next morning, the army leader arrived and ordered everyone to stand as media personnel began filming. The army leader claimed they had captured all the rebels who were disrupting peace and labeled them as activists. This sparked outrage among the group, who vehemently denied the accusations and demanded their freedom, leading to the expulsion of the journalists. A man grieving the loss of his son inflicted harm upon himself. Subsequently, the group discussed their actions and potential escape plans. A distraught boy refused the bread offered by Liahu. Suddenly, the secret police announced that they would conduct investigations. They stated that those who confessed would receive leniency from the government while those who didn't would be deemed terrorists. The prisoners rebelled, shouting accusations of communism before being led to an investigation room. Upstairs, some of their wives waited anxiously while others blamed their husbands. In the prison, a boy recognized a man who had previously beaten him for writing Free Europe. When Leahu confronted the man, it led to a fight. Suddenly gunfire echoed, prompting soldiers to order everyone to lie down. A casualty was discovered outside, leading to a ban on restroom use. The cold, coupled with the inability to relieve themselves, made sleep impossible. When a soldier dropped his gun, Staniz returned it and asked to call his wife as a reward. In the prison, everyone suffered. Staniz gave his blanket to the young boy and questioned his presence. Initially, the boy claimed innocence, but Staniz later discovered that he had also been involved in the shootings. In the women's section of the prison, the inmates
inmates were released. Meanwhile, a man, who had lost his son, received a newspaper article about his child and was seen mourning. Some of the prisoners were allowed to call their families, who sent them personal items and tools for Christmas. They fashioned a ball from their socks and began to play. A television was brought in, and they celebrated the new year together in prison. Both the prisoners and the soldiers joined in the festivities, eating, drinking, and having fun. Staniz was then called into the office for an investigation. The officers were suspicious of everything, and Staniz explained that the gun found with him belonged to his friend Voiku. He was asked about a tunnel plan and was promised freedom if he revealed it. However, Stanesi claimed ignorance, and the officer made him sign a paper. Later, he was seen crying in the restroom. As Staniz prepared to leave, he offered his blanket to a young boy who refused it. He then gave it to Sharif and bid everyone farewell. He visited Lucia's family to assure them of his well-being, but they treated him poorly. He returned home, where a radio broadcast played a song of freedom in honor of those who had sacrificed their lives. The narration concluded by stating that many people died in December 1989, and the last prisoners were released on February 1, 1990. And with that, the movie ends. We hope you enjoyed our video. Watch the next recaps on the screen and don't forget to subscribe for more amazing recaps. See you in the next one.